we've talked about UNAVCO, and there we go. Awesome. Um, and we've talked about Plate Boundary Observatory, and I talked in general on Monday about what kind of resources are there. And so I wanted to show you where they are and what's available. And so this is, this is my cheat sheet that's on here. So this is my backup plan. Um, I will just stand there <laughs> with a little <laughs> uh, laptop. Okay, so this is the homepage of UNAVCO. And we have um, tried to make it more engaging over time and provide uh, articles that are of interest to a broader audience. Um, so we write highlights that talk about the kinds of things that happen with UNAVCO staff, a technical highlight or an educational highlight. And then we write uh, science snapshots, which talk about the science that has come out of the projects that UNAVCO has supported. Um, these are usually National Science Foundation researchers who have applied for um, using our equipment somewhere, and it's not our equipment, it's the nation's equipment. And, uh, and then there's usually pretty interesting science that comes out of this. Uh, one of the highlights that uh, we just put up was about the um, museum exhibit that's in the Cascadia region, and it happens to be about you know, the plate tectonics of subduction and the earthquake hazard and et cetera. And so um, you know, if you're ever in Newport, Oregon, I welcome you to uh, go visit this exhibit one of the things I'm doing now is writing material to take out, pluck out different pieces of it. Um, for instance, making this picture bigger. Uh, this first image here is, um, on the right-hand side, is about the technology of an earthquake early warning system of the future, and um, talking about how our body is the sensor right now, and for most places that's the best warning you have is that the earth is shaking, so it's not really much warning at all. Um, but you can do something with it, right? You can be prepared and drop, cover, hold on. And then, you know, if you combined that technology with seismometers or that technology, seismometers and GPS, and what kind of um, better warning system you could have. In fact, that's a, a close-up of, of that. Um, so this is in development to actually create more materials that anyone will be able to pick up and use in your exhibit area, you know, maybe as printouts, um, and uh, try to make it. Here you go, Bob DeGroote. <laughs> we did that just for you. Um, so that, that's on the UNAVCO webpage, so you can see um, you know, we all work together. Okay, so that's part of some of the learning materials that we have. We also have, um, and as of Monday next week, it won't say learning here, it'll say education, slight change. Um, but you'll be able to drill in. Uh, we have multiple, lots of resources available through our website. Um, one of the areas is the Data for Educators page. And I think I showed this the other day. Uh, so again, if you're looking for real science data, authentic science data, it's um, updated on a daily basis. And these are all the stations that are Plate Boundary Observatory GPS stations in Alaska. You can see there are a lot of them all the way out the Aleutians. Um, all the way along this boundary here, and then a number spread out through the upper part of the state. We realize there are some gaps here, the size, almost the size of California. Uh, yeah, um, so that's, uh, that's still part of the mystery. Um, Got to have something to look forward to in the future. Uh, we were, Yesterday, we had gone down from uh, Anchorage up the 
turn again arm, right? Thank you. <laughs> and so the close, there's a few state GPS stations close by, one that's down in the Kenai Peninsula and one that's northeast of Anchorage, uh, I guess closer to uh, Palmer. And so you can click on these green uh, bubbles and there are the time series plots, which we're not going to go into a lot of depth on them, but let me go ahead and open this one up. So this is, this is a station that was near where we were yesterday. And Rob talked about how the GPS can measure how the ground is moving in three directions, a horizontal motion, and this has a pointer. There we go. So there is a north direction. And so what they do is, uh, scientists do, is they split the data into something that is understandable and readable into three directions. So when the uh, dots over time, you know, strung, strung together, it's moving. The GPS is actually moving in a northward direction. And here's the east part of it. And rather than going up, it's going down. So the opposite of east is west. You guys are awake. Awesome. So this station is moving northwest. But this is, like I said, very close to where we were. And so after the earthquake, the land subsided. And now you can see it's moving up. And it's moving up about, at this point, five millimeters per year. And I found that very interesting. To me, that was a new um, item to learn that in the first 50 years, that land had rebounded very quickly, about a meter. Um, but now, it, you know, that rate has slowed down um, a little bit. And it's moving about five millimeters per year. And then hopefully, it'll keep going for another 600 or 550 years at least. Um, so this data is available, and it's free to the public. Anyone can look at this. You can download this data. This is just a graphic um, showing the time series plot. And so wherever you have your museum or park or wildlife refuge, etc., there are stations nearby. Or if you're just curious, um, like for Augustine, we have a lot of stations um, around these volcanoes. And sometimes you get really bizarre data um, because the station might be covered up with snow in the winter. We try not to let that happen, but it does. It snows here a lot. Um, and early on, we had p more power outages because there's not a whole lot of sun in the winter, and the batteries can only last so long. And we had some early technology with wind turbines, and they'd get iced up, and they'd freeze up. I mean, you saw <laughs> the picture from an ace, you know, how quickly things can freeze. So that would freeze a wind turbine, no power. Um, but there's a lot that you can explore and to see, you know, what's happening. So that is, that's one tool. Um, and if you're teaching teachers, we have, a number of activities that are written to explore plate tectonics in general. I am in the process of fine tuning a couple of these activities so that they are Alaska specific. Um, there's, again, really cool data here, and there's a lot of really cool things to explore. <laughs> they, I would say, to a first order. Um, that we have aligned them to some of the standard language, but I wouldn't say that they are 3D aligned yet because we haven't gone through that process of saying, of articulating that, oh, yes, they are talking about argument, you know, they are arguing their case, they are using graphing, and they are, have another, um, you know, they're looking at authentic data, et cetera. So we haven't done that. That's a pretty intense process, but yet, a lot of these have those components. They just haven't been written down. And I have an intern this summer who will be doing just that. Um, 
and she also has a specialty in uh, <clears throat> special education. So trying to make these activities extendable to a broader audience. So those are those that's part of what we have. We also have, and I showed a little bit of it um, on Monday, is the Velocity Viewer. Don't write down these URLs. They are changing. But Google is awesome at finding resources. You put in UNAVCO Velocity Viewer, and presto, you've got the uh, website. And in fact, um, one of the p pages that I had placed on the tables on the way in is sources for earth science data. And I saw a lot of people pick that up. And um, websites of interest. And so we tried to give <clears throat> the Google search terms right in here. And so a lot of the pages I'm showing right now are also on this page. And we extend beyond that. Um, we also show uh, areas of, for EarthScope and IRIS. And on the sources for Earth Science data, some of the things that we find are just cool data websites. Um, you know, practical things like education and outreach, um, open topography, which I'll show you in just a moment, where they have LIDAR imagery, which is a technology that um, sends out a light laser and it bounces back and they can collect that information and then measure the distance to that object. And that means you can find out what the topography is of the ground to you know, five centimeters or so. Um, it's amazing. And depending on what frequency, it can go right through the bushes and the trees so you can see things that you wouldn't expect to see. Uh, another one that you guys might be very interested in is the National Data Buoy Center. So if there is an earthquake someplace else, um, like Japan, you can actually see the tsunami impulse moving across the ocean as it goes through these buoys. When the earthquake hit Chile, <clears throat> I could see, see it moving through. Um, and same thing with um, the Japan earthquake. Yeah, there we were at like 1 o'clock in the morning, and I'm looking at data, but that's kind of what I do. OK, so um, let's take a quick look at Alaska. And you know, I thought about this uh, last night because this is, again, what I do, how it can be challenging to look at Alaska as one large state because the state is you know, almost half again the size of um, the rest of the United States. Um, and so I thought I would just kind of zoom in. And so I'm going to. And I'd like to think that this interface is pretty easy to use, but I'm still trying to improve it. Um, I'm not sure if it's something that you would maybe have the public use, but it's really useful for getting snapshots of what's going on. And so before, with the Data for Educators site, <clears throat> I was giving you links to the data. And you can do that by showing these station labels. But here, you can kind of get a nice regional focus. And so even if we just focus in on Anchorage, um, Rob was talking about how complicated the tectonics of the this, of this state um, are, and just in this region. We have isostatic rebound from glaciation. That's one component. You have the little ice age, isostatic rebound. That's another component. You also have the glaciers melting. So that's yet another component. They're small. But then you have the 1964 earthquake. And the ground here is still adjusting from that earthquake. And so you see areas that are kind of moving, actually, towards the uh, tectonic plate boundary, and other areas that are now um, <clears throat> moving away. So it's kind of confusing. Uh, but here's the station we were looking at a little bit earlier. And 
one cool thing um, is to just explore and change how you view the world. You can. Um, this will actually change. Someone asked about reference point, uh, North America reference frame. You know, where is that one point in North America that everything's comparing to, or an area? And it's, it is an area. Well, you could change it to be the Pacific Plate. And I know this is early in the morning to like blow your minds, but you know, here we are. Okay, so while that is loading, I'm going to move on to another um, cool tool. Uh, let's go back to it. Um, I'd actually. So a feature, a re recent feature, is that Google keeps changing things, and so we used to have a um, 25 millimeter scale that was at the bottom of the map, and up until Wednesday last week, our programmer, he's a um, student at University of Colorado, was trying to get that scale to show, and so here's the feature is that the scale bar, which is in purple, is just off the bottom of the map right now. <laughs> it's not showing on the map. Um, so if you move it up, then you can see, oh, there's the scale. And so that length of that vector right here, here it is, is 25 millimeters per year. So you can see you know, this is much more than 25 millimeters per year. It's probably like 40. Um, and this one is 10, 12 millimeters per year, et cetera. And then when you let go, it hides. So that's something we are working on. Um, some people call that features. So glycis, glacier isostatic adjustment. A lot of people call it glacial rebound, but Did you say that before the little ice age? and then there was a little ice age. Oh, okay. Yeah, so we had like big we had big glacial, okay. yeah, changes. Okay. So there's this uh, a, a, one of our partner organizations is Open Topography, and I was talking about they, they are using lidar, you know, the light. Detection and ranging is what LIDAR stands for. They have data from many different organizations. They've pulled it together. They provide it in a way that you can pull it right into Google Earth. Um, right now, these, there are two red dots. One of them is up in kind of the Denali rate region, and the one's right along the coast. I downloaded the one up and around Denali and put it into Google Earth. Awesome. And, and so I can zoom out. And I've got a big X, meaning that it's, you can see it's kind of loading in some of the data sets. Um, OK, so Denali is, I would have to zoom back out. No, this is not Mount Whitney. Um, I'm sorry, Mount McKinley, uh, but it is that region, and <coughs> so we're going to zoom in here, and I'm sorry about the X's, that's unfortunate, because that's the cool stuff. Um, yeah, I'm trying, yeah, there we go, awesome, okay, so what do, what do you think this feature is right here? Could be a river, could be a glacier. And how about this thing here? You guys are awesome. Okay, let's take a look at this. Yeah, from straight above, it's hard to see. But once you start zooming in, 
you can see that this is a landslide. Yeah, it's very cool. And um, so this is another resource to explore. There aren't a lot of data sets that, in, are there, that are in Alaska, but you can see a lot of landforms. You can see the faults um, on, in a lot of these areas. So I'd say that's, you know, that's another great resource to use. I did talk about the um, PBOH2O, and I believe that I have gotten that onto one of these handouts. Sarah, how, how are we doing for time? Two minutes? Okay, cool. Um, because another cool thing, it, it's this is Something like if you've got someone who's visiting um, and they really can't get out into the wilderness, but they're really interested in technology. We have, uh, we created this um, game that's looking at polar power through the night. That's a big thing in the farther reaches of the world. It was a project that was developed um, for the PolNet project, which was putting in instruments in Greenland and Antarctica. And right here you can look at some of the um, simulation of the data. And then kids can actually say, well, OK, I want to take a bunch of stuff. Uh, helicopters are really expensive. How much weight can I take with me and still get power throughout the solar winter? And it's, it's fun. It's fun to do. It's, um, and it is scientifically accurate. Uh, we had many renditions of it over time to come up with something that was both fun and accurate. That's kind of hard sometimes. Um, and it's, uh, an, it's a neat exploration. And then I'll just finish with the UNAVCO um, project that was done by one of our research um, affiliates, uh, Christine Larson, and she's just, she's very, she's brilliant. Um, and she had this idea of looking at the signal, and I did show this the other day, um, the Plate Boundary uh, Observatory H2O data portal and the spotlight map Again, the spotlight map is really cool because it's stories. It, and it's written in a story fashion about the science. And um, you can see in Alaska, we've got uh, three. And I, I did show a little bit of these the other day. Um, so for Augustine, we have uh, Max Ender, who happens to work at UNAVCO, but he also has worked on Augustine um, from a scientific standpoint and looking at what's happening there. Mm -hmm.